turn it over to Alan. Great, thanks very much. Hello everyone and welcome to the Public Knowledge Project Annual General Meeting. I am Alan Bell, the Chair of the Advisory Committee, and I am pleased to see so many of you joining us today. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that we find ourselves in the middle of Indigenous History Month, when we honor the unique heritage, cultures, and traditions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples of Canada. Simon Fraser University, the institutional home of PKP, respectfully acknowledges the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Quaquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations on which SFU Burnaby is located. I am grateful and privileged to live on the traditional territory of the Tawasan and Musqueam First Nation and acknowledge all of the Hulkamenum speaking people who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. I would also like to recognize that you are all joining us from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. What a tumultuous and unprecedented year. The COVID pandemic has provided us with untold challenge, hardship, and anxiety. There has also been the Black Lives Matter movement and other major political and economic crises across the world. PKP has come through the past year having risen to meet these challenges, carrying on differently, but carrying on. For example, we have worked with CLO to launch a new regional preprint system, CLO Preprints, that runs our open preprint systems and which directly supports rapid access to new research on COVID. Our coalition public uh, partnership with ARUD is now supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council through their Pan-Canadian Knowledge Access Initiative, a directed grant that supports our goal of sustainable open access publishing in Canada. We have welcomed a new development partner, TIB, who will be our first major partner in the European Union. Many thanks to Marco Tony. We are all looking forward to working with you on the advisory committee. Finally, we have made strong slide strides towards web accessibility in our platforms and as a development practice. However, PKP is still facing significant challenges. As a community supported organization, we are concerned about the current economic climate, particularly as it affects university budgets. Our sustainers have remained with us, but I know at the University of British Columbia, this year and next year will be a challenge and none of us know what the future will bring. More directly, we have seen significant change in the ranks of PKP itself. Marissa McDonald, PKP's communication coordinator, stepped down in May for a library position on Vancouver Island. Marissa was responsible for last year's PKP rebranding and for our new communications and membership strategy and has definitely been missed. Kevin Stranick, PKP's former managing director and current membership development and community education manager and long serving PKPer since at least 2005, will be leaving PKP to take the role of university librarian at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George. As a key member of PKP for so many years, Kevin has had a hand in just about everything. I personally loved working with him when he was managing director and I know that he will absolutely be missed by everyone associated with PKP. However, it is great that UNBC has found such a great leader for their library, and the good news is I believe that he, can I, he and I can probably figure out ways to work together again. As PKP looks forward to the remainder of this year and next, we see room for optimism, launch of a new service provider directory, which Kevin and Marissa both worked on, improvements to our release testing processes that we look forward to sharing with the community, Development of a much clearer picture of the overall usage of PKP software globally, thanks to research done by Stanford student Sarab Kana under the guidance of Alec and Juan, indicate that PKP has a tremendous future ahead. Although this last past year has been a challenge, PKP has met it, and we are beginning to look ahead to the coming year and beyond. In the opening section of the AGM, we will hear from James McGregor, PKP's Interim Managing Director, and John Wilinski, PKP's Founder and Director and professor at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. James will be providing us with a brief summary of the year in review, and John will follow with some thoughts on change. We are hoping to retain 50 minutes at the end for questions, but I encourage you to add your questions to the Q&A whenever they come to mind, so that we have some idea of the number of questions from the community. Uh, and with that bit of housekeeping, uh, James, please take it away. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you again for chairing the advisory committee um, for a number of years now uh, for the wonderful introduction. 
Um, I will just advance the slides here. So I'm just going to provide uh, a brief um, year in review here. And in fact, um, for a, a more in-depth year in review, um, you can actually go and take a look at the 2020 annual report. Um, this has just been prepared and, and drafted and put online uh, right now. So it's available um, there to, to take a look at. Um, it includes uh, a number of the things that I'll talk about today um, around development, um, community uh, engagement, um, sponsorship, sustainership, um, SCOS, Coalition Public, uh, um, and just our general engagement out in the world, uh, as well as our financial statements, um, which I'll, I'll uh, cover briefly here as well. Um, but I did just want to hit maybe a couple of the highlights here. Um, Alan already touched on some of them. Um, first off, it's been a year of change. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the COVID pandemic has, has certainly turned things upside down. Um, PKP as a, as a remote organization maybe has been a little bit um, less affected from the, for the, for the day to day um, overall. Um, but, but we still do miss, um, deeply miss um, seeing folks at conferences and uh, just being out in the world and, and, and engaging uh, with you um, in, in your own areas. Um, so we're looking forward to, to hopefully some brighter days ahead on that front. Um, we've had a number of staff changes over the past year. Um, starting actually, I think in May of 2020, Angela Rash, our former budget coordinator, left PKP to return to school. She had been working for PKP, I think, for at least 10 years um, and had been a, a sort of an integral part of managing our grants, managing our finances, and even managing our HR. Um, so she's missed. Marissa McDonald um, stepped down in um, May of this year um, and is working as a librarian on Vancouver Island. Um, and uh, before she left, she did, as, as Ellen mentioned, just a lot of work towards um, developing a, a, a rebrand strategy, um, an overall communications approach that is new to PKP, um, and provided us with just a lot of information and a lot of work um, and a lot of material to work on um, in the coming future. And then finally, uh, Kevin, <laughs> uh, stepping down first. Um, um, he, he stepped down as managing director in, in the fall and I, I was, I think, volunteered uh, into, into the position. Um, anybody who says change is as good as a rest uh, does not take on an interim position in the middle of a pandemic. I can say that much. Um, and Kevin is now, as, as Alan mentioned, a, a university librarian uh, up at UNBC. And I'm sure he's going to be um, in, our, in our orbit for, for many, many years to come. Uh, he will be missed. Um, he's been like a, an older brother to me in a lot of ways. He's been working with PKP since 2005. Um, and I feel like uh, I've just followed in his footsteps from support and documentation to PKP uh, uh, publishing services coordinatorship to uh, the managing director position. So Kevin, uh, thank you for everything. I will be in touch probably still fairly regularly. Um, we have new staff um, through this year. Um, Emma Uhl, um, started in um, the fall of 2020 as a support specialist specifically for Coalition Publica. Um, and she's been working with the RED staff on providing support and outreach to the, um, to the national infrastructure that we've developed with them. And that's been really valuable and just a, just a real worthwhile engaged area that we can work on with RED. Uh, Lin Zhang started in the spring of 2020 as our new budget coordinator, um, taking over from Angela, stepping into a very um, deep role uh, in the middle of a pandemic without the ability to, to meet a whole lot of people who are integral to running that at SFU. And she's done just amazing work to, to keep us afloat and keep us running. So thank you, Lin, for that. Uh, we had Kate Shuttleworth start as a um, sort of, an, uh, she's been within the PKP sort of environment, I think, for some time, but starting in 2020 has started to work with us um, as a publishing services specialist, as well as her um, library position within the SFU library. Uh, and then we had um, two new developers join, uh, Anhike Ramos uh, as a sort of a core full stack developer from uh, Brazil. Um, just started in the fall. Um, and Eric Hansen, who's actually a, library, a SLACE graduate as of, I think, this month um, from UBC, uh, started with us as a developer uh, full time this year as well, um, previously as a student. Um, and then just this month, we had uh, uh, Alejandra uh, start with us uh, as a publishing student, publishing graduate student uh, with the SFU School of Publishing. Um, she'll be doing an internship with us this summer as well. And uh, it's great to have her on board. We do have a new partner in uh, TIB. Um, thanks I, I did, overwhelmingly to Marco Telney, who's been a long-standing PKP community member. 
Um, Tib joined the PKP Development Partnership in February, um, or is it January actually? Um, and we'll be supporting uh, a whole range of things from actual, I think, video hosting to conference service um, opportunities, um, providing a lot of technical support um, through Dulip with the Nage, who's also been working with us uh, on a range of things for years and years. So that's, that's um, not just our, our first European development partnership, um, but a really long informal partnership that we're really excited to see being formal, formalized. Uh, we have new funding in the form of the uh, SHRC uh, Pan-Canadian Knowledge Access Initiative grant. Um, this is a major directed grant from uh, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council in Canada, which is one of our federal research agencies and granting agencies um, who are supporting Coalition Publica, so that is RED and PKP, in developing and supporting um, our national infrastructure project. Uh, we're just really grateful to have that opportunity, especially in this kind of year. So I did want to cover just a little bit of the financial report here. Um, these are sort of the larger numbers at a glance. This is our revenue. Um, you can see there's nothing terribly different than last year. We, we did enter this year sort of in a period of uncertainty. We weren't quite sure how things were gonna go, um, but it turns out that things in terms of publishing services, our grants and our de development and partners and sustainerships went actually quite well. Um, our SFU library uh, in kind uh, stayed strong as well. Um, you will note a fairly significant uptick in the development partner and sustainership. That is actually almost entirely in part to SCOS. So those are our community um, um, development, uh, community sustainerships there um, showing their strength. Uh, and then the expenses, again, fairly um, typical here across the board. The only sort of strange blip we saw was a significant um, decrease in the community support and outreach expense. And what that is, is travel. Um, so our travel to conferences, paying for hotels, airfare, all that stuff. We, we uh, didn't travel at all, I think, uh, in, the, in the fiscal year of 2020, 2021. So we can see a, a significant dec decrease there. Um, our personnel increases, in, it did increase as, as we expected and same with our infrastructure. Those are just things that we, we prepare for and track. So on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to John. And I think that by John's request, I'm just gonna stop sharing the uh, screen here so he can take a look at some of our faces. Yes, I don't, uh, thank you, James. I didn't want any false expectations about a slideshow. And I just uh, also wanted to see Alan's smiling faces. I gave my just, uh, talk. Let me give thanks to James uh, and Alan as well for their service as managing director and as chairman of the board, as I kind of think of Alan. Um, and a tip of the hat to Kevin um, and his uh, 16 odd years of service to PKP um, and all the best for him. Uh, I, the theme for this AGM is open to change. Um, James came up with it in a flash of brilliance and I'm really appreciative of it. And I have five minutes, so I'm calling this open to change take five. Number one, PKP is open to change. Uh, in September, PKP, formed a committee on how PKP can do more to address and address and resist anti-Black racism and other forms of racism. That is not only the longest title for any committee we've ever created, it is a reasonable and ethical response to conditions that have become all the more alarming in this world. Um, and is part of the whole social movement that we generally think of as Black Lives Matter. Uh, and it is uh, complemented by a new, just forming, a decolonization working group that we're just getting underway. Um, and so this openness within PKP is a strong starting point um, for us uh, in this world of change. But there was also the pandemic. And here, I want to point out that some of our major partners are open to change, and so is the entire field of medicine. Cielo implemented our preprint server, this is an OPS, uh, a new system for us being open to change. Um, and they just reached the 1,000, one, excuse me, 1,000 preprint um, in the last few days. Um, and they uh, had their first preprint on COVID in April. That's within weeks of it being declared a pandemic. Cielo was posting COVID preprints. Um, and I say a change in medicine because medicine had no tradition no history, almost no preprints 
um, within the field of medical research um, because of a general sensitivity about the issues. Um, but open science triumphed. And I think we can point to the vaccinations, the multiple vaccines, excuse me, that were developed um, as a result of this new openness. Um, the uh, Med Archive, which was another, uh, not our using our system, but they have 13,000 preprints uh, for COVID. And again, in a medical field that had no preprints prior to this. So whole fields are opening to open science and our partners are part of that. PKP is open to change part two. This is actually number three in my list if you're counting. Um, here we uh, have for a number of years uh, thought about or challenge, faced the challenge of how many users are there out there of our open source software. Uh, and we started over from scratch this year with a whole new approach uh, in terms of data science. And Sarab Khanna and Jonas Raoni both went at it and we have brand new figures that Alec will go over in a little bit of detail, um, but it is an order of magnitude increase because we went at it in a new way and because we're open to new techniques and strategies in terms of uh, data science. Uh, the last two, four and five, are potential change. We're open to change in the sense of we are open to changing people. We are open to making change. Um, and here, the first one is the law. Not the easiest thing to change, but I have to say the Association of Research Libraries and the Canadian Association of Research Libraries and the Washington College of Law have all been open to entertaining PKP's proposal for copyright reform. We actually have two publishers that have signed on and endorsed it. Um, and we have a proposal that will change copyright from an impediment to open access um, to a facilitator. Uh, of open access. And we've moved away from beating up on the publishers for not moving uh, to open access more quickly because we've realized in our analysis of the law that copyright only favors one approach. And we need that law to change in order for it to favor what is proven to be the best for science. We are using a model, by the way, um, uh, part of this whole thing has been to see where, what model would work, and we're using the music industry. Beyonce and Joni Mitchell are our inspirations um, for this change, and we believe that the Music Modernization Act in the U.S. and efforts in Canada form a good model for opening research um, to the world. And it's like, there are more details on that to come to. Finally, universities may be open to change. This is the most radical aspect. Um, we're starting in Canada with the idea that students are being double charged for their readings assigned in class. Um, there is no cognition of the open access movement. There's no recognition that the works that are being shared are already available in the library. So we've conducted a study. That study has been cited in a factum um, that has been delivered to the Supreme Court of Canada in the current case. So it's the first time PKP research has made it to the Supreme Court. And we don't know yet that this is an ongoing case, so we don't know if it's played any kind of role yet. But we've introduced a three-step syllabus rule. You heard it here first. Um, and we're hoping that we can create a system in which students will no longer be charged for works that are already part of the library or already open access. Um, but they will continue to support, in the case of Canada, the Canadian poets and novelists. So five areas of change showing that the world is open and continuing to open to change. And we are looking forward to being a part of that going forward. Thank you, James. Thank you, John. That's great. So yeah, in, in this uh, next section, we will hear from Kevin Stranick, PKP's Member of Development and Community Education Manager, and Alex Mecker, PKP's Associate Director of Development about a few great advances that we uh, can expect from PKP this year. Kevin will be talking about PKP's new service provider directory, which will be launching soon, and Alec will be talking about PKP's new approach to release planning and our new approach to community engagement in priority setting and our new approach to tracking usage of our software throughout the world. I think next up, it's Kevin. All right. Thanks, Alan, and thanks, everybody, for those um, kind parting words. Um, it's been a delight to be part of this project for so many years and to work with all of you and with this community of people around the world who are, who are with us today. Um, James, you could just move on to the next slide. I just wanted to talk just for, for a couple of minutes about um, a new program that we're going to be launching very shortly, the PKP Service Provider Directory. You can see a, a link to it there. Um, it is live and you can, you can go and, and click through it. 
and essentially what we've put together is a listing for the for the various members of our community that provide services um, out to the world. Um, if you provide services using OJS or OMP or OPS, um, we'd welcome you to the directory. And we put this together for a couple of reasons. Um, we often got questions from folks on the forum asking, you know, I can't download this, I can't install it myself, I don't have the, the technical ability, who can I go to for this? And of course, there was always PKP Publishing Services um, who they could work with, but of course, there were many others out there who were providing services. And this is a way to let those potential customers know um, who they could get in touch with, who they could potentially work with. Uh, maybe they would prefer to work with somebody in their own country, um, somebody who's got um, greater facility in their language. Um, so we wanted to make those options really clear. The other reason that we wanted the directory was to acknowledge the contributions that these service providers make back to PKP. Um, some of them provide financial, um, acting as sustainers or development partners. Um, some of them make in-kind contributions, um, code contributions, translation work, um, participating on our community committees, um, working on documentation in so many ways. And we really want to do more to acknowledge um, all of those contributions because an open source project um, is only as strong as its community members and the contributions of those members back. So the application process um, involves filling in a form. You'll see a link to the form on that page. And what we are looking for are trusted um, community partners who do make a contribution back to PKP. Um, we'll be reviewing those applications. If we have any sort of any, un, anything is unclear, we'll get back in touch with uh, the applicant, have a conversation, um, and go from there. Um, we've got a handful of pilots there. Thank you to everybody who's on that list for uh, running through the application, helping us make some changes to it to improve it. Um, we'll continue to um, review the application process and make any changes as more people apply um, and become part of the uh, the directory. So one of the next steps will be to widen the invitation list. We're going to be in touch with more people that we know who we think should be on the list, um, but also to uh, have other people who maybe we haven't had as much contact with um, make the application and we can have a conversation with them and, and have a bit of a chat. Right now it's very simple, um, just text on a web page. Um, down the road, we're looking to maybe make something a little bit more fully featured, something that's a little bit more searchable or filterable. Um, a little bit maybe more readable. It's pretty bare bones right now, but it gets that core job done, uh, meeting those two goals that I mentioned above there. So this is something that we're we're really excited about. We're looking forward to it, and uh, it's going to be a great way to get to know more people in the community who maybe we haven't had a chance to to be in touch with yet. So I'll I'll leave it at that for now. And um, if there's questions um, in the Q and A, maybe maybe we can come back to them at the end of this session. I think then it's on to Alex. Sure, and uh, yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, this is going to be a little bit dry. So uh, before I start, I just want to say that we are a remote work organization. And uh, of course, that means that we're affected differently by the pandemic than a lot of folks who were working in offices. Um, but for everyone, it's been an isolating experience. And uh, I just wanted to make note that the last year has been really inspiring for me personally to see the strength of our community maintained in spite of uh, all the changes that were happening. Um, and to see also what was happening uh, for the pandemic for so many of you in your respective corners of the world. Uh, it's been really an amazing way to see uh, the strength of our community and to see how this is, of course, affecting everyone differently. So thank you for sticking with us and for uh, carrying on in, in the translations and the documentation work uh, in the various work I'll be presenting next, actually. So yeah, it's been uh, very personally rewarding. I'd like to thank you all for that. Um, so what I've got here is uh, just a view of the uh, the last half of last year and the first half of this year. And you'll see that uh, in bold here, we've got uh, the various stages of development and release of OGS, OMP and OPS 3.3.0, which kept the development team quite busy through that time. That's almost the background noise, the regular work that we all do, um, which uh, is a tremendous amount of work, but I'm actually going to focus on a few other things that we did at the same time. And those are in smaller font below that. Um, one was we finally were able to release the preservation network plugin for OGS 3.0, which I know had been waiting for quite a while and represented a, a lot of additional work and delays that, uh, that we were very happy to finally get behind us. So that's now available. 
Um, and then there's a few things here that uh, I will at least make reference to or present a bit about uh, coming up next. One is the, the beacon, uh, which has already been alluded to, which is our way of me measuring the user community for our software. And I will mention that in just a moment. Um, we've done, for the first time, we've commissioned an external uh, report on accessibility of our software. We've done a number of different uh, attempts to improve accessibility internally, but it's one of those things that really needs to have uh, professional expertise. And so we did start that work and the OJS 3.0 release, um, which came out in the first quarter of 2021, uh, is the first software to include uh, what we can confidently say is an accessible front end for readers, the, uh, the default theme. Um, so that's a major piece of work. And that's the first step that we'll be pushing through uh, in the future with additional parts. Um, we uh, also launched a survey with a technical committee and I'll, I'll present some more about that as well. And then a few uh, details here that uh, just are kind of side notes in our, in our, um, our development work but are indicative of kind of the, the, the maturation of a lot of processes that uh, are become necessary as the team grows, as the software gets more and more usage. One of those is to look at the way that we're using third-party dependencies, which we are doing increasingly as we try to rely upon those uh, more and fewer of our own kind of in-house um, implementations. And that's, uh, there's one slight negative uh, impact of that, which is that uh, we are now dependent on the security of all those dependencies as well. So we've change the way we've managed those a little bit uh, to make sure that we're following up on uh, best practices, keeping up to date and avoiding um, that new source of potential security issues. Um, and to that same end, we also launched a security mailing list. And uh, this is sourced originally from the beacon. So some of you uh, have likely received an email about our, our, our last uh, um, dependency related security issue. Um, and you will have been signed up to that mailing list because you're participating in the beacon, which I'll present on in just a second. So again, some ways to make sure that uh, you're kept up to date with any kinds of issues and that we are doing our best and following best practices for that sort of thing. Um, I will also mention what's in OGS OMP OPS 3.3.0 in a second and what you're coming up to for 3.4, uh, but we'll get to that. So maybe let's move to the next slide. Um, so in the 2019, 2020 year, that's uh, last year's AGM, uh, we finally published a public roadmap. And this is something that we'd been informally maintaining internally. And uh, uh, we brought it together from a number of different sources for internal management and committed to publishing it externally and to making sure that uh, the community had better visibility on these two questions. What are we working on and when will it be ready? And uh, so that has been available for a year and uh, we've used it as a tool to uh, coordinate with, with various partners who have their own projects We've used it internally. It's been a really helpful thing for us to have and maintain. Um, so that's a successful part of what last year's work was. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, James. Um, the next thing that we've been working on is for each one of those releases, what the internal development process looks like and how we arrange that um, to solve a few related problems. One is how we coordinate with the community. And uh, if you, for example, worked on translations, you'll know that um, we haven't in the past articulated well when the release will be made, uh, when a translation uh, opportunity exists for those folks who are doing translations to do that work, when that translation work will come out and so on. So we're working on that. We're also um, seeing a lot of uptake uh, from third parties in coding their own plugins, for example. And those plugins are made available within the software in the uh, plugin gallery. But that involves a contract between us and with these third party developers whereby they can understand when they need to make uh, compatibility changes for new releases and that sort of thing as well. Um, that applies to themes, it applies to modifications. So we're trying to make sure that we incorporate in our own practices tools that will help to uh, inform those third parties how they can uh, coordinate with us uh, so that they're kept up to date as well. And this is just the maturation of our project and looking at other projects that have similar distributed communities and things like plugins, and that's Word WordPress, for example. We also really want to do two things, um, these last two points here, which are to improve the software quality upon a first release. So when we make a major release, it has a lot of new code and that new code is going to be uh, where uh, we, we, we release something with a, a bug or a, a missing feature or a misunderstanding of a feature request. And then we have to work to, uh, to improve that. We wanna make sure that when a, a software release comes out from PKP, that there is a level of quality and certainty around moving to that software. And we're not, we're not chasing uh, some bugs that should have been caught in the, the quality control process uh, after that first release comes out. And then the final goal here is to facilitate upgrades. And these are all kind of tied together. Um, 
our community is often often struggles to find the resources to perform an upgrade and uh, and wants to make sure that when they do perform the upgrade they aren't uh, in that process of tracking down bugs that have gone out in the software if it's a, a new release so um, our goal is to be able to facilitate upgrades so that the community can move more to a more recent release with the confidence to do that and that we don't have to support the community through uh, upgrade issues, bug fixes, tracking down issues on, on three, four, five years old, old uh, releases of the software. Um, so this is an ongoing process. And this diagram here, I, I won't go into it in detail, but essentially the takeaway from this is that um, at the top of the diagram, and we're moving from the early stages down to late stages as we go from top to bottom, involves uh, the operations team, so internal folks within PKP, and then it involves the development team, which is the green thing. And then as we move towards the release, it involves everyone doing everything all at once. And so that bottom row, that stripe of all those simultaneous boxes in the diagram, that's where we have to do our troubleshooting. And those are simply processes that we have to do. That's testing, it's bug fixing, it's translation updates, it's updating plugins, it's updating documentation. And those all have to happen at the end of the, the development process before release happens. So what we're doing is we're formalizing a lot of the things that go into that. Um, you can see on either side, these little arrows throwing out uh, different artifacts. At the top there is the roadmap is, is updated, the, the planning process, that's communications uh, uh, piece. And then on the left-hand side near the bottom, there's two release candidates. And those are uh, test packages of the software that can be used first in, internally and then externally by the community to, uh, to uh, make sure that everything's working as it should. And then on the right-hand side, there's the change orientation and then the release notebook, which are two documents that um, uh, that basically inform the community about what can be expected and how first as a, a developer to work with the new tools and then second as a user, as an editor, as somebody who's training uh, folks to work with the software, what they can expect. Um, we have learned a few lessons already. One was to avoid the new year. Uh, we, we started the release process in quarter three last year for 3.3 and we finished it in quarter one this year and uh, that essentially two, three week process where everyone's gone for holidays uh, was a, a loss of momentum. So we're trying to avoid that. But the biggest piece that we've uh, still got to work on is the upgrades and stability. And uh, we, we did, um, through the formalization of this process, make some major strides towards it. But the changes in 3.3 were so profound and fundamental that we still uh, weren't able to release that software without it being as stable as we'd like for future releases. So we're going to continue to work on that. And our goals remain the same, to improve the software quality and to facilitate upgrades. And those of you who were able to participate in the external testing, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, that did result in, in better software. So all of you out there doing translations, testing, documentation, that really does help us to make sure that our software is the best it can be. It is a community effort. I will move on to the next slide, James. All right, so a couple of quick slides about what's new in 3.3 and what will be coming in 3.4. And this is wall of text, I apologize, there's no pictures here, but just to be very quick about this, there are blog posts for each of these on the PKP blog. Uh, I mentioned the accessibility improvements um, and I, I cannot overstate how important that is to us. It's very, very important to our community. And uh, as we've made reference to a number of different attempts to become a more egalitarian project, this is one of the major ones. Um, as far as workflow goes, we've done a lot of work on um, editorial lists and that's one of the major things that were identified in the survey, which I'll, I'll uh, go through in more detail in a second. Um, but also things like communications, mass emails, exporting user lists to CSV, all that sort of thing. Um, under the hood, uh, there is a major change in 3.3 in the tools that we use to communicate with the underlying database. And that's what I made reference to earlier, the kind of major change that resulted in just a number of different stability issues that came up in the 3.3 release that we'll be making sure that are, are uh, taken into account as part of our release process in the future. But that's the deprecation of the ADODB library, which has been part of OGS since 2.0 and has now been replaced with a much more future-proof tool set. And this will facilitate the speed of upgrades. Um, it'll be more reliable to upgrade. And it'll be a thing that we build on in the future uh, as we um, mature the 3.3 and 3.4 lines of releases. And uh, you'll see the impact of that, I'm sure, quite clearly. Uh, next slide, James. Okay, so currently the dev team is working on OGS, OMP, and OPS 3.4. That's, uh, um, again, a very major release for us. It's currently scheduled for release in the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, I will make no firm promises we're going to stick to that, but we'll do our best. Um, and we're doing a lot of work around things like statistics, uh, so counter R5, and reports based on institution and geographic uh, areas. Um, we're starting work on the accessibility of submission forms. And so our goal with, submission, with accessibility work is to target um, the largest audience um, 
and then move towards those more specialized roles like users, uh, like editors and managers. But uh, having done the, the, the front end, the, um, the default team, it now makes sense to work on the interface for authors. So the submission forms will be our next step for work. Um, there is a very major cross-ref and DOI overhaul going into 3.4, and that's probably one of the major the top three features, I would say. And then we've also heard that uh, email composition and communication management has been an area for improvement and though. Uh, so we'll be doing some work based on that. Um, under the hood, I won't go into the details here, but uh, we're doing a very comprehensive overhaul of the software just to make it uh, more modern. Uh, for those of you who are working with uh, current PHP development, you'll see some of those changes will be very familiar to you. And uh, that work is likely going to be invisible to end users, but is really going to be a, a positive change for those who are working with the software. Um, James, you can go to the next slide. Okay, um, I want to speak for a moment about, well, two uh, little sub projects we've been working on. And these are uh, not my work. So I'll, uh, first I want to say, I want to give all credit to those who are doing this work. I've got their names mentioned on the next slide. Um, the first of those two projects is the technical committee survey. And um, this is an answer to the question uh, related to the changes we've made last year in publishing the roadmap. What happens to future requests in the forum, in GitHub? Uh, the answer to that is it's informal. We don't have a formal process for handling those yet. And the second question is, is the roadmap reflective of community expressions of interest? Do, do we, when we put together a roadmap, adequately address what the community is asking for? So this began as a project in collecting those feature requests and categorizing them. And we ended up uh, collecting uh, those into, it looks like about eight different categories. Um, and these are close, but not exactly the same as the ones that we've categorized on the roadmap. And that's, that's not a coincidence. That's uh, not that those were sourced from the same place, but but the, we've attempted in the roadmap to do the same thing, which is to categorize uh, the main sorts of requests that we get. Um, and then we can communicate uh, without sending out folks to all of those really specific and very software wonkish uh, uh, issues in GitHub. So the, um, those eight categories then inform the way that we designed a survey around that. If you go to the next slide, James. The survey uh, basically requested that the community at large, and I, I suspect several of you on this, many of you on this call will have answered that survey, um, to prioritize those categories for future requests. Uh, what were your top uh, categories? We received 524 comprehensive responses to the survey, and these are very detailed responses. And so I have to really pass my thanks along to the community for, for doing those. Um, of the top three identified categories, uh, there was a, a much more detailed uh, survey on those features um, based on, I believe, the individual uh, features that were grouped into that category of, of, uh, of changes. Um, the survey was faceted on three different dimensions, uh, OGS2 versus OGS3, uh, the length of time that uh, the software was used, and then the role of the user. Uh, were they a, a host running a server, or were they an editor running a journal? Um, we still get to analyze the free text responses, but that's a lot of really valuable content. And a number of us have gone through uh, those in an initial way, and we'll be working to, to summarize those in, in more detail soon. We will be hosting a webinar um, soon to come on this in more detail. So if you're interested in this community information and especially how we connect it with the release cycle, that'll be something to watch out for on the, uh, the PKP Twitter channel and the blog and so on. Um, so you'll see that uh, the, the leftmost, the one that folks overwhelmingly ranked as the number one most popular area for improvement is managing submission lists. And uh, it looks like it's cut off on my screen. I believe it's not the same on yours. Um, that uh, does actually uh, reflect well against some of the changes we have planned for 3.4 and I've already done for 3.3. Uh, the second highest element was peer review and editorial. So the, uh, the backend workflow for editors. And then below that, things like managing articles, uh, email functions, stats, uh, managing journal issues, and then managing users. Um, if I can just go to the next slide, uh, all credit to the technical committee on this. Uh, this was really an arm's length um, exercise and uh, it's a really valuable thing for PKP as an organization to have the technical committee, which is uh, com composed of uh, mostly folks who are not within PKP, although there is some crossover for folks who share a role, for example, with an institution, um, to, to play a, a bit of a critical role and make sure that we are, we're kind of held to a standard on the way that we plan, the way that we release, the way that we communicate that's informed uh, through that outside expertise. And so these folks really put in a ton of work on this and, uh, and it'll help us to make sure that we align our roadmap with what the community is looking for in the years to come. So please do watch for that presentation to come up and, uh, and please do attend. Uh, next slide, James. Okay, um, and the last thing I'll present on is the beacon. 
which is a bit of a weird project. Um, and it's aimed at answering these questions, who is actually publishing with OJS and where are they publishing? And once again, we, we always speak first about OJS, but this does apply to ONP and uh, OPS. And so we haven't forgot those applications. Everything that we do to improve OJS also improves the other two applications. But as our user community for OJS is just so much larger, um, that's, uh, that's gonna be the way it is when we, when we re refer to it mostly. So um, credit for this is to Saurabh Khanna and Jonas Raoni uh, with PKP. Uh, also, we had uh, Michael working on this and Kevin and myself and Juan. It's been a, a team effort, but those two definitely get a lot of uh, uh, credit for the current work. And this started out as a question of how do we list OJS sites, OJS journals, OJS users, and they quickly turned into a research project and it will continue to be. So we're gonna treat it more like that as we talk about the results. Uh, next slide, James. Okay, so in short, the way that the beacon work, works is this. Uh, when you have the beacon enabled, and this is a thing that's uh, possible to enable and disable in the configuration file, and when you have uh, the, the version check, which is built into OJS, there's a small exchange of information between OJS and PKP that takes place when OJS checks to see if your version is up to date. And you may have seen that there's a, a notice on the system when uh, you're running an older version of OJS saying that there's a new version and uh, you should consider upgrading. When that happens, if the beacon's enabled, then it tells the PKP server when it asks for the newest version, uh, it tells the PKP server uh, what your URL is and what a, a, a unique ID is for that installation, just to help us with disambiguation, which is a, a large subject. And then that's it. There's no other data exchanged, uh, but we can now, once we have the URL to that installation, which is, which is public, if that installation is public, uh, then we can query it for more information by looking at the website, manually by looking at the OEI interface and listing articles through that by other mechanisms as well. And so we're using that mechanism to identify journals and then to query those sites for more information about what they have published. Uh, next slide, James. So uh, I'm not gonna go into details here. We will additionally have a, a workshop on this um, to go into the, the research aspects of this. But in short, it's really hard to take a list of journals and to to ascertain whether or not those are duplicates, whether they might uh, be hosted within, let's say, SFU, but have a URL that reflects the journal as a unique entity. Uh, if that is a testing installation, uh, a number of other things. So a lot of work went into this part, and that'll be for the webinar to disclose. Um, if you go to the next slide, James. But the preliminary results, and I, I feel like we're burying the lead here, uh, our previous estimate at the number of active journals was around 10,000. Um, currently, there appears to be more than 25,000 actively publishing journals. And when I say active, what I say, what I mean is that there are at least uh, 10 uh, published articles in these OJS installations uh, since the year 2019 began. Uh, and we'll soon flip that over to 2020. We leave a window of time for, uh, of course, uh, in-process articles to get published. Um, and that heuristic's been with us for a while. So that number was so large that we, um, in the last uh, month or so, went out to a number of community partners and asked, can this really be an accurate number? And so we went to about, uh, about a dozen community partners, that's folks that we, we know who are well aware of their community within a particular country, for example, and said, does this look accurate? And they all came back saying, yes, and you missed these additional ones. <laughs> so uh, our user community is larger than we ever thought it would be. I will point out that there is uh, about 11,000 of those journals alone are in Indonesia. And we know our Indonesian community is gigantic. That indicates just how large. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to publish this as an open data set. James, you can go to the next slide. And we're going to work to further build confidence in those results because they are just so gigantic, uh, but they're too gigantic to be able to assess uh, comprehensively manually. So we're going to publish this as an open data set for OGS, OMP, and OPS, and then disclose kind of the methodologies that we used as though this were a research project. And um, hopefully if there is anything there that we're missing or that we're duplicating, we'll be able to identify that ASAP. But uh, we have not been able to find anything yet that indicates that those numbers aren't realistic. So uh, I will be turning it over to Saurabh and Kana and, and uh, Saurabh Kana and Jonas Raoni for that presentation. Uh, so watch again on the PKP uh, Twitter and also on our blog for details about that webinar to be posted. And uh, we'll get into those details in as much detail as you could possibly want with that. Uh, there is a lot of future opportunity for this because it's a very, very large data set. Um, and that's both research and pragmatic. We could look at the way that disciplines use the software. We could look at regional usage of the software. 
Um, we can also identify languages uh, that are available because folks have done the translation work, but not contributed back to us. And so it could be a practical source of things like additional translations, maybe additional plugins, who knows what. So we'll be using that as a source of uh, ongoing news and, and research for, for, I'm sure, years to come. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, I believe that's the end of what I had to present. So thank you. Uh, we'll take questions on all the stuff at the end. I see there's already some coming in, so we'll do our best to catch up on those. Oh, God, we're good. That's great. Thank you so much for uh, that presentation. That was amazing. Um, we do have three questions. What were we for now? Um, the first one is in Spanish, and uh, I don't know if I want to, if you can uh, answer in Spanish, but uh, the translation I have is how can the academic media like ibeecampus.es access a summary with links to the main research results of the uh, 10,000 PKP journals? Uh, maybe I'll try both in English and Spanish. I don't know the group that you're referring to specifically, but uh, I think the next step for that's going to be to publish the um, uh, the open data set from the beacon, and then next steps will become clear from there. Um, you can of course contact us, and we'll be able to uh, um, we'll be able to to work with you on that data set. Uh, we're not sure what form we'll publish it in yet, but uh, we are of course open to taking guidance on that. Great, thank you. Um... The next one, is there any public information available on the anti-racism and decolonization efforts that John mentioned? Thanks, Alan. Um, I can take that. Um, right now, there's not a whole lot of public information. We have um, a, a small EDI statement that came out of the initial work from the summer that's available on the website. Um, and that's part of our code of conduct. So if you go to the website and, and just look at the community code of conduct, you will see a small statement there. Um, we realized, I think this summer, we had a lot of work to do uh, internally to, to sort of process this and actually work towards something productive, not just performative. Um, so we've been doing the work. Um, with respect to the decolonization efforts, um, I think the next month or two, um, we're going to be really focusing on internal education and reading. Um, and then after that, once we Get to the point where we're comfortable launching a, um, a working group there will be um, a, a community-based approach to that um, that will include um, indigenous voices in the community um, as a core part of that um, and that will be um, discussed at some point in the next month or two i think um, through the through the blog so you'll see news and information about that great thank you for that i was really interested in that when uh, john mentioned it as well um, this is a question that we've had before. Um, it's a great question. Uh, have there been any attempts to get commercial users of PKP software to contribute financially, or is the sustainer program mostly aimed at universities? Um, I can take that one. Um, yes, we have. Uh, we do have some sustainers who are commercial users. Um, examples of uh, Biteca from Columbia, um, uh, Ubiquity Press um, is also a, a financial supporter. Um, but the, the overwhelming um, sustainer representation is from universities and that, that reflects the user community as well. Um, but the service provider directory is providing this, uh, this opportunity for us to do more um, focused outreach and we will be looking particularly at the commercial providers and um, you know, introducing ourselves if we haven't already <laughs> gotten to know them and uh, talking to them a bit about how they're using the software and uh, reminding them of the importance to contribute back to ensure a, a healthy, vibrant open source community that they're benefiting from um, through their commercial activities. And, you know, we love financial contributions, of course, because that helps us do the work, but we also very much value the in-kind contributions that come back to us. And many of the things that um, James and Alec and John talked about today are all really reliant on those in-kind contributions. So um, good question. And yes, this is uh, more work is, Going to be happening. Perfect. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, the next one, um, I'm just going to do it because there's some good things in the chat too. Uh, so uh, congratulations. This is uh, uh, very interesting and challenging on all the advancements, um, Alec. Uh, the one question was, can we share in the social network this incredible slide with 25,000 sites? Yes, please go ahead. I think I said preliminary on that slide. Um, so as long as it says preliminary, I'm okay with that. Sounds good. And uh, someone said, uh, Caitlin said the beacon sounds ominous. And uh, the one suggestion was we could call it Kevin Beacons. 
uh, I think that's, that's a good tribute to Kevin yeah. as well. Kevin, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Well, we could take some other ideas too. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's very good. Okay, uh, we are developing plugins for OJS, which will publish citation and ge geographic geological information to OA websites to improve the findability of small independent OA journals. And this is from Tim. Which OA OJS versions should we target? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, and actually, I'm I'm in touch with uh, with you folks. Um, already and will be attending a meeting coming up in the future. And that's essentially the way that I think is most helpful in aligning two dev teams on working on a project is to just get us in a, a virtual room and talk about the implications. Um, I can't answer specifically in your case until we've had that meeting, but generally speaking, uh, it's a balance between how big of a community do you need uh, now, which would suggest that you'd want to support a broader a range of releases versus how much work do, does it need, do you need to do to make sure that um, the work that you're doing on a plugin is compatible with two, three, maybe major releases of the software. Um, I think my general recommendation for any folks considering this is to target the current stable release, but make sure you do talk to us about what's coming up in a future release to make sure that you don't you know, release something uh, and then have to turn around and rewrite it immediately because a new software release has come out. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, do service providers have to be assessed to be included in the directory? And do you have the criteria they have to meet? Uh, also wondering if there's a fee to pay to be a PKP service provider. Uh, James, do you want me to take this one too? Yeah, please do. I'll take that as a yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jenny. Great question. Thank you. Um, at this point, we're just doing um, internal reviews um, because we we've got a good relationship, a strong relationship with, with the applicant so far. But going forward, as we start to um, work with people that we don't know, um, we will likely be looking to put together a, a community review um, panel. Um, one of the things that's on our agenda around community development is to reestablish the members committee that's been dormant for a couple of years. Um, and this is the kind of role that a, a, a rejuvenated members committee could take on would be um, forming a, a review panel to look at the applications um, and to go through them and assess them and uh, work with that group if they don't obviously meet the criteria um, about what they could do to to meet that that criteria um, and the criteria is you know one of the most important ones is do they contribute back in a meaningful way to the project um, and there are some service providers that may be just getting started, they don't yet have the resources to contribute back, but they plan to, what does that plan look like? And when could we expect to see them contributing some of their code back? Uh, so those kinds of things are definitely um, on our radar for including that. And there is no fee, um, it's it's all about the glory. Absolutely, no, <laughs> no, there's, there's no fee to be part of it, but there is um, the requirement for contribution, whether financial or in kind or both. Great, thanks, Kevin. That was the last question that we have, but um, James, there is somebody with their hand up. So I wanted to see if you wanted to check in on that. Yeah, I just noticed uh, Dominique, um, it looked like you had your hand up. I'm not sure if you wanted to, to say anything, but I've uh, enabled the speak thing for you if you like. No, no. Okay. <laughs> nice to there hear you a, anyway. a question that came into yeah. me privately that I'll just answer, which is, is there a URL for the technical committee's report on, um, on the survey. And yeah, that'll be coming extremely soon. I don't have one right on hand. And so we'll make sure that that goes out on the PKP blog and the Twitter uh, feed as well. Great. And I should note too that um, this, so the recording and the slides and the annual report, we'll release that later today, hopefully, depending on how fast I, I can get the recording out. Um, <laughs> so that'll all be online very shortly as well. Okay, are there any you know, uh, private questions that have come in to any of you? Because it looks like that's all we've got, which is just about perfect timing. Mm -hmm. So that was fantastic. Um, I am so proud to be part of this community and be uh, part of PKP. Um, Kevin, we will definitely miss you, but uh, again, I look forward to working with you from UNBC as well. Uh, does anyone else wanna say anything in closing? I just wanted to say thank you, Alan. 
um, for, for chairing this, for chairing the advisory committee. Thank you to the tech committee. Um, thank you to the community for everything that you've done this year. It's been a, it's been a crazy year. It's been a crazy year, but yeah, yeah. we did it. Uh, so that's great. So uh, thanks again for everyone for attending. Uh, and with that, I think we can let you go about your day. Thanks very much again. Thanks everyone.